Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Victory XR Show. Today, we have Elizabeth Hutton from the Dwight School, and I'm going to ask Elizabeth to tell us a little bit more about herself and, and, and the school, but the, the key to today is that we're going to be talking about IB studies. A lot of people in the United States aren't that familiar with IB, but globally, it's a, uh, it's a type of curriculum uh, that is very popular and very well respected. And so Dwight is a New York school that reaches out to students globally and uh, uses this particular type of curriculum. And so we're going to talk about how it fits into with, with XR, AR, VR, that type of thing. But before we, and Elizabeth, I should say, is the director of IB studies at Dwight. So the perfect person to talk with us about how they are integrating virtual reality simulations into their curriculum. So Elizabeth, tell us a little bit about Thanks yourself so much, and a little bit about Dwight. Wonderful. Um, my name is Elizabeth Hutton and my, in my current role as um, the director of IB here at Dwight New York, um, also supporting our online pilot program. So we are incredibly uh, proud to be one of the two schools that is currently piloting, offering the full holistic IB diploma program online. Um, Dwight has an incredibly rich history of the IB. In fact, we were the 58th school um, in the world to be accredited back in the early 1970s. Um, and since then, we have all three programs. So um, the IB program, while maybe um, more well known for the diploma program, it actually starts down with the youngest learners at age three. So our uh, middle years program and then our primary years program is our youngest learners. And then in 11th grade, um, so that's 17, 16 year old range, that's when they enter the diploma program. Um, you know, since the inception of New York, we've had launched IB schools um, all around the world. So we have a school in Shanghai, in Seoul, in London, um, soon to be Hanoi. Um, and then we also have um, another school here near New York, across the river in Jersey City. Um, so we have a rich network of schools. Um, and Dwight as a school, I mean, innovation has always been on the forefront. Um, we want to know, you know, who are we serving? What are our needs? And how can we bring students um, the best education possible to prepare them for their future? Um, the IB's mission, along with Dwight's mission, is to create these lifelong learners that are culturally, ethically, and socially responsible citizens. Wonderful. And so talk to us a little bit about, for all those who don't know what IB is, you know, how, what is it? How does it differ from what people might uh, normally be used to? Yes. Um, so what really differentiates the International Baccalaureate is that it's a it's a program. Um, and so in the center of the program or the framework or the philosophy is shared by all teachers and students. So when a student is in the IB diploma program, there are certain core elements that define what it means to be an IB student. So at the center, you know, is the learner. But then surrounding the learner is what we call the IB learner profile. So yes, there is the most rigorous, you know, gold standard of curriculum, um, advanced calculus, physics, et cetera. But also in tandem to really exploring the academics is, you know, how are we teaching students to be caring and to be balanced, open-minded, inquiring, really looking at what we call these learner profile attributes and looking at how can we, through the curriculum, not, not separate, not just in an advisory, but actually through the science curriculum, the history curriculum, look at multiple perspectives, um, really examine, you know, how do individuals know how can two individuals know and both be right yet have different ways of knowing? And so it's a course that is, again, looking not just at the content, but really equipping students with the skills to learn. Because I think that most can agree that in 10, 15 years from now, um, the types of jobs and subsequently the types of college majors, et cetera, the demands, the skills might change, but we really want to equip students with, again, that desire to learn and the skills of how to self-manage, um, how to conduct research, um, how thinking skills, right? How are you making your thinking visible? And so one of the beautiful things about an IB education is that teachers and students and families all are part of that philosophy. So recognizing that learning doesn't just occur in these four walls. And so the student is always at that center of the education. That sounds wonderful. And so 
uh, you and I first had a conversation about a year ago about potentially how virtual reality could could serve this uh, curriculum and this program. Um, what is the problem that we are solving? So in bringing the IB fully online, um, the I, what, of course, one of the reservations that could be had is how are science labs going to be accomplished? Um, so in addition to leading the program, um, I'm also a science educator, um, having a biochemistry background, um, teaching biology and chemistry in brick and mortar schools for the last you know, 15 years. Knowing what students are going to need, right, when they enter into university, um, you know, what will that look like? How can we ensure that students are having the manipulative skills needed? How are they having the collaboration skills in a lab? Because so much is beyond just can you identify glassware, right? That can be taught on paper, but when students have to make, you know, forced choices in the moment, um, when you have to have those moments of on the spot thinking, of analysis, of collaborating with others, there is no substitution, right? Um, there are many virtual simulations that can exist, but only in virtual reality, you know, are you able to actually add the human element, right? Um, there are things that are unpredictable that can happen. There are choices that the user in VR can make that then will impact the next step. And so it's a layer of interactivity. Um, there's a layer of decision making that has to happen throughout the labs using VR and also for, you know, teachers to be able to give students the full experience to be able to customize, um, you know, what are those um, skills that are needed? What are those areas that need to be developed? So as we think about a lab scope and sequence, right, as science educators, how can we build in skills where students really are, you know, autonomous in the lab where they can go into university um, and be successful. So just because they have not been in the physical lab, um, you know, really needing to rethink, you know, are, are those students our next scientists? And the answer is yes, um, but they're being prepared in a slightly different way. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So are you using your IB labs or do you plan to use them more in a synchronous or an asynchronous way? So in terms of the labs, I think it's incredibly valuable that it's in a synchronous component. Um, it allows for, you know, again, that on the spot teaching. In fact, in some of the labs, um, colleagues have been able to join in, um, you know, helping students to be able to, you know, again, with measurement, understanding why am I recording to the tenths place and not the hundreds place. And honestly, those same conversations that are happening, you know, in a brick and mortar lab are also happening in the VR lab. Okay, why do I need a rubber stopper? What happens if I am that my flask is not fully sealed? Um, and so having those moments quick correct are incredibly vital. Where the asynchronous role has come is that especially the IB, um, you know, it is a curriculum that is very much, you know, based on critical thinking and problem solving. Um, every course is a language course, so how do you express yourself as a scientist or a historian? But there also is a culminating exam, um, a very high stakes culminating exam. And this exam will require students to take a series of papers um, in May after the two years of the program. And what VR has allowed students to do, and yes, these students are, you know, geographically separated, but our students, uh, my grade 12 students, have been able to come together, you know, in the Oxford Library, in the quad, in these different areas, and, and practice their skills. And so able to see their engagement um, and the planning that they are able to do on their own and decide how are they going to manage, how are they going to best prepare, um, has been really wonderful. And a lot of that is, of course, occurring asynchronously um, because different students will you know, be in different parts of the world, they'll meet up at different times, um, some students want to do it on the weekends, and so it is very much encouraged um, and supported, right? So this is what you can accomplish in a session. Um, but yeah, that's how that's how the balance of that asynchronous and synchronous is occurring. Yeah, I, I love that because even though the students are remote and may be in different countries, they can still be in a classroom together if they choose to uh, with with walls and equipment, just like they would if they were in person. It's, it's just such a, a perfect use case. Can, can you give us a specific example of an IB uh, simulation that, um, that that is contributing to the education of your students. Yeah, I, I you know I think about the chromatography lab. It's actually you know one of my favorite labs. Um, so for the non scientists that are listening, is essentially you have this piece of cellulose paper and 
plants have pigments, right? So just like, you know, as humans, we have fingerprints. Uh, plants, based on their pigments, will have, you know, when you separate them, there'll be a chlorophyll, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, some carotenoids. Um, and so there's unique fingerprints that different plants have. Um, and, you know, again, often in virtual simulations or even in my school lab, right? We're, ba we're rushing around on time. We have 45 minutes. I'm gonna go to the store, buy some fresh basil or spinach and give it to the students. Um, one of the elements that I was able to, um, you know, suggest and um, the company was able to implement was that let's have let's have a bunch of plants. Let's have students think about, okay, this is a cactus type plant. This is a more, uh, a broad leaf. This is a more variegated surface. This leaf is, you know, much more, um, you know, narrow. And so students get to go in and take a clipping uh, but before that, they get to see visibly, right, all the differences between the plants and to be able to begin to predict, you know, what type of pigments are going to be needed. Um, they start to think about climate, right? So why would there be a thicker leaf? Um, thinking about like water retention, thinking about, you know, where these plants thrive. And of course, that can indicate how much pigment um, would be present, even time of year. And so that lab really has been able to, um, you know, that's something that you wouldn't be able to do in real life. Um, I wouldn't be able to buy all those plants. The cost effectiveness of that would be, um, you know, absurd. But in VR, we can have you know, options where students are then forced to think about, okay, how do I do this? Um, and even in making the um, the separation of the pigments, you know, students will have the water, the ethanol, again, different compounds where they have to be mindful of, you know, okay, how, why am I choosing this? And so there's continual moments of thought that have to occur in these labs. And then of course, time, right? Um, you know, when doing this lab, generally, you're gonna be waiting sometimes 15, 20 minutes. Um, when you see the results instantly, right, it's allowing students to have multiple trials in a short amount of time. And so they can really see the difference and be able to, you know, see the patterns, see any discrepancies um, between the pigments and the different types of plants. So that's one of my favorite labs. That's brilliant. And so talk to me a little bit about you worked with our Victory XR team. They, you know, maybe they know something about chromatography. My guess is they probably don't know much. And uh, although they're all really bright, talk to me about the process that you went through as the SME, the subject matter expert, and, and how that worked uh, dealing with uh, the developers. Yeah, um, so it was definitely you know a collaborative endeavor. Um, you know, our science team at Dwight Global, we were able to you know work together, um, and you know having history and years of data, and you know thinking about misconceptions or where students are forced to make choice. Um, so we really would start with equipment. Um, so that was always one of the first conversations, you know, with the coding team, with the education team, thinking about, you know, there is so much equipment that students don't normally have access to. So if we're talking about the effect um, of light intensity on photosynthesis, you know, in most labs, you'd use a light, but we can actually simulate the sun, right, at different distances or at different points in the equator. And so dreaming, right, a lot about the equipment, um, the advice that was given to me by your team is like, you know, like just what is like, you know, no limits, you know, not having time, money, etc. cetera. Um, what would you want students to be exposed to? And so thinking about the use of incubators and, um, again, other equipment that may not be able to exist in high school laboratories. And again, with purpose, not just bringing in the fanciest, you know, bells and whistles just because, but having, you know, agitators and having machines um, that, again, students might not even see in their undergrad. That has been, you know, really, really helpful. I think then, you know, actually working with a team where they are building um, and you get to see, have that feedback in real time. So as there's a build, right, getting to see, okay, here's a progress video, here's what I'm thinking. Um, I mean, we would go back and forth just on a Google Doc where it's it wasn't an overwhelming task deciding on these labs. Um, and having a non-science expert build them, they, they're gonna ask questions of, well, this doesn't make sense, right? So we have to make sure it's, again, they're self-driving um, and that, teachers, right, aren't trying to at the same time get used to the tech, that they also then have the ability of it's there's in, there's some intuition built in how the instructions come in, thinking about the sequencing events. Um, and I think one of the most powerful things is the outcome, right? So the data. Um, that's really where 
you know, the science, the IB curriculum focuses on, when you get data, how do you process it? How do you choose to present it? And the fact that in the simulation, the same data number is not coming up every time. So then Steve, if you and I were both working on, you know, an enzyme lab, you may get a slightly different result and we can then discuss concepts of, you know, variability. And so that is way beyond my understanding of how to build that in from the tech side. Um, but I have yet to come across and, you know, over the pandemic, um, many companies did open up free access to labs and having taught higher level biology in labs, of course, I was trying them all out. But every time there's a simulation, you get the same output, the same response. The fact that um, with the VR tech that you're able to uh, embed variability, that has been a game changer because in more advanced science, it's not just the process, but it's also, okay, how can we critically look at the data? How can we choose to process it and again, present it so that it tells a story and links back to the original question? I love it. I love it. <laughs> when you speak, you sound extremely smart. So for a business <laughs> guy like me, I, I appreciate that. So um, talk to us a little bit about accessibility, the, the advantage of accessibility through this uh, medium. Yes, um, you know, many students at Dwight Global, um, you know, Dwight Global, one of our missions is, you know, that personalized education, right? So again, allowing students to pursue what we call their spark of genius. And so if a student is, you know, a swimmer that is training five hours a day, or it's, um, you know, an, a fencer or a ballerina or a trombone player, um, we have many, many students that have, you know, incredible sparks of geniuses. And these are students that without the flexibility of an online school, they would not be able to do both pursue their passion really at that pre-professional and professional level. Um, and then also receive, you know, an incredibly, you know, um, high quality education. So that is really, um, you know, one of our markets. There's also the access market with IB because it is an international curriculum. Um, that we're able to reach students almost on every continent. Um, we have, you know, a, a small to medium size of our first and second cohort, but we have students, you know, all over Europe, the Dominican Republic, um, Hungary, Ethiopia, Kenya. We really have, um, you know, spanned um, many, many countries. And there are a portion of students that um, just wouldn't have access to this type of education or even access to course choice. Um, and then there's, of course, a smaller percentage, smaller percentage of students that for, you know, other reasons, whether it's a temporary medical or physical issue that aren't necessarily attending brick and mortar schools at that moment. Um, so, you know, we don't view as an online school as an alternative of like this didn't work. Um, there's a big group of students that actually they prefer this way of learning. Um, they enjoy having more intense, you know, focus periods. Um, more control over their schedule, more breaks throughout the day. And so you take these students from all walks of life and you're able to actually bring them together, right? Another one of, you know, Dwight's driving uh, mission in principles is this idea of community, right? Um, sometimes there's a paradigm shift, right, that has to occur when you think about online school or AI. Um, you know, Dwight Global has been a leading online school since 2015, um, so ahead of the pandemic curve. Um, and so there is a personalization and a community that can happen. And AI has actually been one of those community building elements. So yes, we're, you know, getting together to, you know, put intestinal systems together and to look at the brain and to, you know, see what we notice about the heart. But there's an extra layer of, you know, um, with students are able to engage in where you're looking at each other in the eye, where you're able to, in those down times, you know, be able to connect um, in ways that you wouldn't before. Um, so there are students that, you know, whether it's a vision impairment or something else where they wouldn't be able to participate in a lab um, because VR um, is able to be so up close, um, you know, those students have access to you. So it really is expanding access um, and really, again, equity, because accessing an IB education can then open doors to university admissions, um, you know, all over the world. That's wonderful. So two last questions. First, what reaction are you getting from your students when they, uh, when they learn in VR? 
Yes, um, they absolutely love it. Um, they often come to me with tips of, you know, miss, it'd be better if we all had the video or, um, you know, there's different levels of access. You know, I have the privilege to work with a smallish group of students. So they have pretty much convinced me to give them pre all levels, except summoning. They can't summon each other. Um, but they have all levels of access of they can, you know, mute, unmute. They can pull out different tools. They can pull up videos. Um, and again, that trust was grown over time, right? because they have to be able to show that they're going to be responsible and, you know, bring in appropriate and relevant objects. Um, but and there's definitely a digital citizenship element. Um, and we actually wrote our digital contract based off of our IB learner profile. Right. So what does it mean? How can you be caring in VR? How can you be principled? How can you be balanced? Um, and so really using that as an educational moment to talk about, you know, technology and, you know, the role it plays. Um, but no, they absolutely love it. Um, you know, we have been able to, again, the work with the parents. Parents are aware that children have these devices. Um, of course, safeguarding becomes, you know, we work with our tech department, um, you know, our legal and to make sure, of course, that um, they're minors, right? So what access they have, et cetera. But we have fully um, partnered with parents and we've had 100% support from our parent community um, with this tool. That's awesome. So uh, first of all, that's the first I've heard of a school giving their students that level of, uh, of control over the environment. So that's really interesting to me. Uh, someday I wanna understand that better. So that's that's great. But final question, what is your looking forward what is your best hope for where we can take this? You know, I, I know that I think we have a good relationship. I think we plan to continue building this out. Where, where should it go from here? Um, you know, one of the spirits of IB, and again, Dwight too, is like partnerships, collaboration, right? Um, if we have 20 IB teachers that are using this, with you know, how can we have those teachers uh, collaborating, and forming communities, and forming these you know really professional development um, you know communities that they can talk about best practice. Um, teachers at heart are incredibly um, they share. You know, we things are free. We put them online. If someone takes them, you know, most teachers feel like flattered and honored. Um, so we really you know want to think about the lesson planning aspect of this. How can this tool be used for differentiation? you know, not every student accesses the content at the same point. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges in education is differentiation, right? Um, typically, you have one teacher in the room and you have multiple kids that will fall into different groups. And so for many teachers, right, that becomes this constant, you know, it's an art, right, that you learn over time. But thinking about how VR can, you know, assist in that, um, and again, there's differentiation up, right, to the students that are, you know, above the content level you're teaching. There's students that are on what we've deemed in our state or our school is, you know, on target. And then there's always students that are in needing of extra support. So um, I just think the possibilities are endless with how we can have teachers are not feeling that they are the only teacher in their classroom. I mean, the fact in VR that you can take a video and have clone yourself explaining Again, after so many years of teaching, you know what the misconceptions are, you know what the issues are. And to have a video, you know, pre-ready about, okay, this is where the, the you know, energy is stored in the bond, because you know you're gonna be asked, because you've been asked the last, you know, 19 times you taught that lesson. Um, you will have a video, or even a video of yourself explaining it. And it's been really amazing of how you can, um, you know, not feel so isolated um, in your own classroom. And I think also the content creation. I mean, there are students. Um, so in the first few lessons, um, some of the VR team would come and just help our students with control. And, um, you know, Danny, he, so many of my students at the end when Danny's like, do you have questions? They wanted to know what was his career pathway. They started to interview him. He's like, I've never been asked this. Um, they wanted to know what did you study? Like, how did you get into this line of work? And it was, you know, and he responded wonderfully, definitely caught off guard. But it was such a teaching moment of that this is actually an entire industry that exists. Um, and it can exist not just in education, but in, you know, healthcare. And, you know, one of the activities I do with my students, it's called the three whys. It, it's called, you know, why does it matter to you? Why does it matter to those around you? And why does it matter to those that you don't know, right? So the other few billion you don't know. Um, and it's a thinking routine that allows students to, you know, sort of have that 
aerial view on it. And we had this debrief, um, you know, about just VR and that really that conversation that they started having with um, the educator at the end of, you know, what other fields and what other industries could this tool have an impact on and what do they see it, um, the role of VR in that. And so the students are the ones that, um, you know, I'm 20 plus years removed from them, but their ideas are brilliant. Um, their ideas are valuable. And, you know, part of the IB is that student agency, right? How are students not just having agency over content creation and what's being taught, but also over assessment. And so I see VR as this, um, this perfect kind of glue between having students have that voice and agency and teachers feeling empowered. And there's this um, synergy that can happen when those things come together. And VR, I think, will be the platform for that. I think you're right. So. Um... Elizabeth, is there anything that I should have asked or is there an important point that we missed that, that you may still want to cover? Um, no, I just, I really do believe that this is where, you know, education is going. Um, you know, I'm incredibly, you know, honored to be at a school that um, has been, you know, on this journey already, you know, kind of ahead of the curve. Um, and know that this is just, again, going to be where flexibility, high quality, um, and it's going to really allow students to be able to engage um, in more than just the uh, traditional ways. So, no, I'm excited for the students to be able to have this opportunity. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Grubbs. I am the uh, CEO of Victory XR. We have loved working with Dwight Global. Our guest today has been Elizabeth Hutton, the director of IB Studies at Dwight. And uh, thank you for pioneering this with us. And we're excited to see where it goes. Thank you.